What more paradoxical sight or scene can you imagine? Six primitives in their war paint, in their loincloths, in their moccasins, sitting at the knee of a star being who had descended from the heavens. The star elder, after a few months, produced a small, flat, green crystal. He cupped the crystal in his hand. And in the crystal, he was able to create images. And in these images were the stories of where he was from, of who he was, and why he was here on planet Earth. If that was not an astonishing thing in itself to these six young men, there was more to come. For in time, in the crystal, the hidden history of planet Earth was revealed to these men. As only an extraterrestrial could tell it, the Star Elder revealed the development of the solar system, the birth of planet Earth, and even the creation of mankind. And he told it not as if it was a research project, but as if he had learned it in school. The stories of the Star Elder passed on through my grandfather, passed on to his grandchildren, and to myself were the inspiration for the research that I am about to present you. They do not clash in any way with our histories, with the documented histories. They do clash, however, with what we are told in the public schools, what we are told on CNN, what we are told in the documentaries. Our histories have been fabricated to serve one purpose, to suit the institutions, to serve the system. I do not wish in any way to denigrate or to attack the system. It has produced many wonderful things for individuals. Health care, medicine, and other events that have made it astounding to, to live in this time. However, there is a price. We have sacrificed our freedom. We have sacrificed our destiny. We have sacrificed our free will. The Star Elder's story spoke of several star beings who descended to Earth and they affected our history. I grew up with these stories and was absolutely, absolutely enthralled. I could not get enough. I have to mention that the Hopi stories and the Apache stories oftentimes talk about star beings. They talk about the star warrior, Sohu. Sohu who descended from the stars to teach the Apache warriors how to fight, to be able to to stand against 10 or 20 men. The stories about Hilili, Hilili who was a witch in the beginning, an evil spirit who descended from the stars and who plagued the Native Americans of the Southwest until such time as the conquistadores, the priests, and the foreigners began to invade the lands. Hilili the star being, the star Kachina, then turned his powers against the missionaries, against the Spanish soldiers. Hilili who was once... A, excuse me, he was a burr in the saddle and a thorn in the side of the Native Americans, suddenly had become a hero. There is a story about Nangasahu, the blue star Kachina, the chasing star Kachina who descends from the sky and who has this very mysterious message. He speaks of prophecy. He tells us what's going to happen at the end of the fourth world. I will reserve that story for tomorrow, but Nangasahu is a mysterious figure. He has a long trailing headdress and a very mysterious black star on his face. Very few elders know his story, and those who do know seldom talk about what he does and his purposes. Star beings are part of the cosmology of virtually every Native American tribe of every primitive society on this planet. We find it remarkable that the civilized world does not allow for the existence of star beings and dancing stars. We find it absolutely astonishing. The arrogance to suggest that we are the only ones in the universe speaks loudly of the foolishness and the arrogance of civilization. I grew up with the stories of the Elder and never once questioned. I had no doubts. I had seen the dancing stars myself. In fact, on Wednesday nights, on special Wednesday nights, we were taken out into the desert to sit on the hillsides, and there we would watch the dancing stars. They would twirl and spin and dance. And when I first saw them, I said, Grandfather, what is that? And he said, Grandson, those are the spirit dancers. Those are the star dancers. 
and said, my God, grandfather, how can I be a star dancer? How can I dance in the skies and the heavens with them? And he said, grandson, you must learn the dance. You must have the spirit and you must have the heart. And I was very fortunate because he taught me some of the steps and I have been able to spend a great number of, uh, of uh, days in powwows. I have competed, I have danced, I have been in ceremonies, and I cannot tell you how important a part of, of, of life dancing is. It is a way in which to express oneself. We believe that the signature of a man, the signature of a woman, is what he does with his body, it is what he does with his spirit. It is not what you do with a pen and pencil, it is how you express your physicalness. The chapter, the book that you write, is done with your body, not with the intent and not with a pen. And I have had the good fortune to become a spirit dancer. I have been able to attend powwows. I have danced for days on end. When the powwows were over, I had the good fortune to be able to go and dance at conventions and, and perform for various groups. Dancing is passion. Dancing is fire. In fact, I named my dance troupe Maksho which means to dance with fire. When I entered college, I entered a new environment, a world in which you are taught to question and challenge everything. We are told from the first days in the philosophy courses, the humanities courses, even in the English courses, set aside that which you bring with you, open your mind and be receptive. When I entered the college system, I was immediately challenged how do you know that the stories of the star beings are true? How do you know that the star elder really existed? Could it be that your grandfather was simply giving you a myth or a legend, some sort of a moral play in which to deliver a message? It was possible. It was disconcerting. I was worried that perhaps they were not true. But I had to find out for myself, and I am sure most of you have gone through the same problem, the same situation. What is life about? What am I doing here? How do I know that the Bible is true? How do I know that the, the Hindu way, the Taoist way, the, 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 the Christian way, you name the faith, how do you know? Perhaps it's a joke. And why is it? I want to believe I just want to believe so badly, Father. I want to believe so badly, Mother, that there's just something wrong. It's not fulfilling. There's just a tiny little piece missing. Well, I never had that problem until I got to college, but I had to, I had to take the advice of the professors. I had to find out for myself what is the truth. Were the star beings false? Were the, the biblical angels false? Were the gods of Egypt false? What was the truth? I enrolled in a religious studies program, the first one of its kind at the university here in the Southwest, and I was able to spend three years looking into ancient documents. And what I found most astounding was that every time I thought I had found the right religion the right way, I found that there was an earlier religion, another way of life that had said the very same thing. I found myself being forced to study ancient languages, to look at the, he the, the Hebrew Aramaic languages, to look at the hieroglyphs, to look at the cuneiforms, to continue to delve deeper and deeper into the past. I actually pursued a study in the world's oldest religion. I was persuaded that there was at least one common source. The names of the gods, the, the stories, the events that, that were uh, in all of the religions of, of the planet were far too similar. Not only were there common threads, there were ropes that were the size of a tugboat hauser. They were enormous. Uh, coincidences and similarities. The word for the the word for God in Apache is the same as the word in New Zealand that the Maoris use. Some of the words used in Australia were the same as the words used in ancient Egypt and Sumeria. Some of the Hopi words that are used are the same as the Celtic and the Babylonian. It was astounding, and I found that in fact there was one religion way way back. But our cultural uh, experts, our archaeological uh, scholars, our biblical... Uh, I'm going to have to use the word experts. Suggest that our civilization began in approximately 4000 B.C. I'm sure most of you have seen the books. 
You've seen the videos. You've heard the numerous lectures who are now presenting evidence to show that the Sphinx is not created in the year 2000, that it was very likely created somewhere around 10,000 B.C. I highly recommend a book called Forbidden Archaeology. It is an extraordinarily large book, and in it there is evidence of civilization, of human beings, of footprints, of beads, of all kinds of jewelry, of hammers in rock strata that are over 1.2 million years old. There is evidence everywhere, and I suggest there is even evidence on other planets in our solar system to suggest that when the experts of our society suggest that life began 4,000 B.C., that they're horribly and erroneously wrong. I suggest uh, Mr. Bauvel, Graham Hancock, uh, Richard Hoagland, Zachariah Sitchin. The authors continue. There are numerous who present evidence. Mr. Von Doniken, who probably began the wave of challenging and questioning the experts many, many years ago, the evidence is astounding. I find it remarkable that you can look in any encyclopedia and you can find a definition for something called ball lightning. It is a fact. It exists. It is real. But did you know that there are hundreds of thousands of photos and videos of documented witnesses who have seen UFOs? 